All right. Can everybody hear me? Is this on? Anybody? All right. I'm wearing one. That might work in a minute. Welcome to FirstNet's pre-proposal conference for the MPSBN. I'm James Mitchell. I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, we've got a pretty good agenda to look forward to. And I'm having Terry Callahan issues with the clicker, for those familiar. So soundboard, please. All right, so today we're going to talk, at least I'm going to pick up uh, today, talking about the FirstNet program at a uh, high level, go through some of our Q&A process and some of the outputs from that, uh, from that exercise. Uh, we're also going to have Mike Poth up here, our CEO, to talk about the FirstNet value proposition. It's the overall deal, and it's, um, it's really probably the, the biggest. Uh, we're we're going to come at this strong. We want to talk about it today. We want to save time, though, for the end. We want to have some uh, remarks from Terry, obviously, on some of the finer points moving forward on key dates and some highlights from the RFP. And then uh, we're going to have a Q&A panel at the end, as we typically do, um, with our esteemed panel to the left here. All right, there we go. So there's the, there's the, the, uh, the agenda for today. As I said, uh, my name is James Mitchell. Most of you are familiar with me. Um, I've given a couple of these. Uh, before I start, I want to thank the industry liaison team, our contract staff outside helping us get all you in the door uh, so we can host this both live in the room and then also on the, uh, the webinar that we have going. We will have video of this conference available uh, in a couple days up on our website. So you know, you can spend Saturday with a beer and me again, as that's probably what you all want to do. But uh, I, I, I enjoy these things because it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to talk to industry. Um, and we've taken a lot of those opportunities recently um, to get us to the RFP. Um, and speaking of industry, this is actually sort of a cross-section of who's in the room and on the phone, on the webinar. We've got a healthy selection from around industry. Um, I want to point out that we've got a big section of other, and other means you just didn't fit into our happy categories that we provided here. Uh, that doesn't mean you only do one thing, it means you do a couple things, and we just like to track this information and, and really do our own business intelligence to see who's watching us. Um, but I talk about how we like to discuss with industry openly our intent uh, moving forward with the, uh, the RFP. Um, by the way, we've almost got 300 registrants for this conference alone. We've, we've done pretty good in, in industry days, and we've maintained a healthy audience moving forward. Um, we've got a lot of familiar faces. I see some, some new faces. Uh, some folks who were with us all the way to the left on 2013, some, some fairly recent with the RFP release. And to those who are new, I say welcome. Welcome to the show. Grab some popcorn. We're an entertaining bunch. It's a, it's a lot of fun to talk FirstNet when you get a chance to have a conversation with us. But um, this, is, this is part of our culture, right? Like We've spent the better part of the past three years growing. And as we've grown, our engagements have grown. Um, all the way back to our first RFIs. Um, you've had the statement of objectives for the better part of a year and a half, almost two years now, which we released in September of 2014. Uh, and from there, we had draft RFP documents in the following April. And that kept the Sioux intact. We followed quickly with the cybersecurity special notice, all the time seeking your input as we move forward. And not just you, states, locals, public safety, our stakeholder community. And we, we certainly consider uh, industry part of that stakeholder community. So we find ourselves here today talking about the RFP. And the last time we discussed the RFP was about a 30-minute webinar. It was very straightforward. We knew you wanted to get cracking, open it up. Um, it's a pretty big document. It's a lot to take in. Um, it was important for us uh, to have that immediate interaction so you knew that we weren't just going to go dark and we weren't going to hold everything back. What we wanted to make sure everyone understood was as the RFP came out and in, as with uh, previous documents that we've released, we were going to keep that information flowing. As of today, we've got um, a, a large swath of our questions based off the RFP answered. We're going to keep answering those. Some of your questions from the Q&A panel today will add to that pile if we can't answer them uh, in the room. Uh, but we are going to have Q&A, and that does get added to our documentation. All of this uh, in the interest of making sure that the RFP you have in your hands, even two months removed, is the clearest it can be, uh, the most accurate depiction of what it is we would like to pursue in order to serve public safety. Um, and I think that shows in most of our releases. Something to consider, though, is that um, 
when I when actually when I showed up to, to FirstNet, uh, TJ Kennedy used to say, uh, well, he still says it. The most important things that we're doing right now are consultation and the acquisition, and that holds true. I, I feel that um, we've had a very a very good run of feeding both teams back and forth. We get a lot of information uh, out in the field when we go and do our consultation, and we treat our vendor engagements very similarly. Uh, it's not just a one-way street. What you're telling us is important to us, and it's reflected in those documents. The same with public safety when we go consult with states and locals is that I told you in our first industry day that your fingerprints would be seen on the RFP, and I think that even after we've released the RFP, there's still, uh, there's still more touch points for us to move forward. So um, a pretty good process all in all, and I think that uh, the response has been uh, very positive. So let's move into Q&A. Uh, we received 402 questions, uh, and that's from all over the place, uh, all corners of our stakeholder community, it's industry, states, locals, public safety, some usual players, some new players. Um, but that's less than our actual draft RFP. If you remember when we put out the draft RFP and the uh, and documents, they, we received 666 questions, and we answered all of those in about five weeks. Uh, and most of those answers kind of felt like, just wait, wait till the RFP comes out, we'll get your answer in there. And, this time we don't obviously have the luxury of pointing to the document down the road. But that was by design because what we did was we took those questions and we made sure when we were drafting the RFP that we had those questions in mind and that um, we really answered them through the RFP process. So we have less questions than before and that tells me a couple things. And based off of the questions that you've given us and you see the topics here and the word art, um, that basically we've released something that you find uh, to be acceptable and understandable and not uh, completely uh, out of um, uh, the norm, uh, which is good for us, obviously. It's good for public safety. It's good for you guys to, to pick it up and run with it. Those 402 questions, most of them were administrative. And, you know, there weren't anything that put us in the red. There weren't any questions that, that sent us running away and going, oh, we've got to rethink a lot of these other issues that we put in the RFP. Now, we've made some clarifying amendments along the way, and that's important. We're supposed to do that. And Terry will tell you that's the regular part of any process that you engage in acquisition. But uh, we weren't changing all of Section M, for instance, or Section L. The things that we asked for and the things we're evaluating on have largely uh, stayed the same. Um, right behind administrative issues, we had technical issues. Uh, and that's mostly because this is a very technical uh, set of documents. Uh, so it was natural that that uh, would follow uh, almost immediately behind that number. Um, we didn't have, uh, we, had, we had 26 submitters, um, again, from all over the place some familiar. I think what was interesting uh, was some of the state questions and some of our responses. You see that we've pointed states back to consultation because these are topics that we're talking about uh, as we're on the road. Um, we had some mix with uh, issues like the reading room and some white papers that we've responded to as sort of saying this is about the RFP. We want to make sure everything we put out under the Q&A banner for the RFP, uh, which goes on FBO, by the way, has to stay within those parameters. So we've been very careful about that. What you see here is a current depiction of where we're at. This is updated last night. We released 68 additional responses to the questions that have been coming in. Um, we're going to continue to do this. And, and as I said, uh, hopefully by um, early next week, mid next week, we'll have the remainder of those responses in the can and out the door. It's important to note that we've all but answered, I mean, we've answered all of them internally. There's a review process. And this is also important to us that it's not just five people in a room responding to the questions in a vacuum. We work closely with our consultation team, our uh, CFO, our CTO, uh, to make sure that the answers we put out are right. So if there's a delay in response, it's not because we don't want to respond. We absolutely want to. Uh, the reason we have any delay in response is to make sure those answers are absolutely correct, that we're getting the right message, that the amendments are made, and that documents are clarified. And that's a long process, and we have to make sure that we do it the right way. If you go to FBO today, I think you'll see four amendments, um, and that has a, a package behind each one of them that includes answers to those questions, as well as, well as clarifying sections in the document. So it's all available out there. Um, my original plan was to come out here and just start reading questions and giving you answers, all 402 of them, but I didn't think you'd stick around too long for that. Um, so that's where we're at right now, and I look forward to the rest of those responses going out. What I want to talk about now are some high-level topics. Um, Really some stuff that we saw initially. Uh, the team did an initial triage of the 400 or so questions, and we started figuring out, you know, is the needle moving to the red? Do we need to really consider our position here? Did we 
lived with the RFP so long that we've, we sort of had Stockholm Syndrome on the documents, right? Like we needed to make sure that there was a sanity check of what we were being asked and what we'd said in the RFP. So when we initially read the questions that came in, we held them up next to the RFP and made sure that you know, everything that we'd said um, in the RFP was captured correctly and accurately. In some cases, when we respond to your questions, we clarify you. We tell you, hey, your question, not really what you're asking, I think. We think this is it. And that's because in some cases, there are references in the document that go in different places. We want to make sure that that's accurately depicted. And that's a lot of our, uh, our process internal. We want to make sure we're getting to the right pieces of the RFP when we make our answers. But like I said, when we got those 400 or so questions, um, there wasn't anything that put the red flag up. But there were topics that we saw repeatedly, and some things that we've you know, so, sort of clarified our answers on as we move forward. And uh, that's also important, is that these things make us think. There's a human element to the question. You know, have we not asked ourselves this very same question as we develop the RFP? And it's important that we pause, and we all look at each other, and we ask ourselves and do our own sanity check to make sure that the responses go out. Yeah, we all agree with this. So that was the initial take on those questions. Something that comes up, uh, has come up repeatedly in the Q&A process are, is our request for capability statements. And uh, we had some trepidation, I think, early on from folks asking the questions that capability statements were uh, a requirement. Um, so if you've been to a couple of these, you've been to our industry days, you've seen us uh, in action. We talk about requirements uh, limitedly. We don't want to talk about requirements. We want to talk about objectives. This is not a requirements-based document. There's some minimum thresholds, obviously, uh, some things that we want under the banner of 16 objectives. But we would never hem you into a position that would preclude you from proposing on this RFP. So with the instance of capability statements, which is largely a logistics concern, right, because we have an aggressive timeline, we didn't require that. We thought that this would give you an opportunity to submit those capability statements that um, really speak to the higher uh, points in the RFP, um, what we're asking for, right, uh, to give you an opportunity to hear from us. It's an exchange. If you read the RFP and our follow-on clarifying statements, we state that Whatever you submit to us within the 50 pages that we've given you, um, we're going to respond uh, and we're going to let you know what we think about those capability statements. And at the end of that written response, we're going to invite you to ask us questions. And you can ask the questions to us uh, through that writing. And you're going to get an invitation from Terry Callahan to talk about those questions and hear us out. And that's really important. And I think that was missed initially. I think we've clarified it successfully. I think that folks kind of picked up on it. Um, it's, it's really kind of key to us that we keep this dialogue moving uh, the best that we can for as long as we can until we truly go dark on the proposal process. Um, and so I hope everyone understands that the capability statements, again, not required, totally optional. But I'm having a hard time figuring out why you wouldn't want to do it. Um, it'll put you in a good place, I think, in terms of discussing things with us. It'll help you get towards your proposals. Uh, I think we'll give you valuable feedback. I think you've seen that. In our Q&A process, we don't just say, look at this section. We actually give you the answer and the rationale behind it, and that's very important to us. And we plan to do the same thing with capability statements. So extension requests, speaking of logistics, um, we got a couple of these. They ranged anywhere from two weeks to eight months. So we're not going to do eight months, right? We kind of lean, lean more towards the two weeks. Uh, we had a conservative response. Um, we gave two weeks on the capability statements because we understood there was some confusion. And we really do want to encourage that interaction. And we gave two weeks on proposals because you have to build the buffer in moving forward. But we're on a critical path to award. Uh, and, and if you've heard us the last couple times we've talked, time is of the essence. It has been for some time. We want to get to an award as quickly as possible. As we know, our offers will want to as well. And so we didn't want to delay too long. Um, we had compelling arguments to move the extension out further, but we thought internally this is the most rational way to, to proceed. Uh, and we hope that that makes your lives a little easier. Uh, it's made our lives a little easier as well. So, uh, Rural considerations. Uh, so we've gotten a couple topics um, around. Uh, I say rural considerations is a banner topic. Rural shows up a lot in our RFP, and that's by design. Um, through the Q&A process, we've defined what a rural telecommunications provider is. We've, spe we've uh, spent some time talking about the IOC FOCs in relation to how we expect rural coverage to work. 
Uh, we've talked about rural partnerships, and this is huge. Rural partnerships is part of your evaluation process. This is something that we think is very important, uh, not just for rural telecommunications providers, but for rural public safety, for people that traditionally we wouldn't be able to reach. This is, this is important to us, and it should be evident in the RFP that that's the case. So we've obviously added some clarifying uh, amendments to the RFP to speak to those rural considerations a little more precisely. Um, in this latest round, uh, I think we'll have even more discussion around it, but again, we want to make sure that we've covered all our bases when we come back out to you. Um, this is one of those things where we've provided thresholds, and thresholds are just that. They're the basement. You know, the more you can give, the more uh, receptive we're going to be to that sort of discussion. So it's important to remember that moving forward. So covered leasing agreements. Uh, talk about confusing, right? So I have Jason Carp here, obviously, and I'm not going to butcher the CLA mechanism, but uh, I'll give you the headline, right? Uh, for those of uh, you proposing this work, you have to understand that the mechanism by which a successful offer will have access to the spectrum to monetize it, um, you need the CLA. That's the mechanism. Uh, it's part and parcel to the actual contract. There are terms and conditions. Uh, we've talked about it in our clarifying amendments back. Um, I think we actually had some clarifying uh, terminology around the CLA, how we can talk about it. Uh, and really, this is one of those things that it's, it's in the act. It's just it's part of our very existence, and it's important for everybody to understand uh, the, the gravity of this, uh, this mechanism when we move forward, when Mike talks about the deal later. So I bring it up today because people did rightly ask about it. Um, they asked, how much can we use? And if you remember the first industry day, if you hear someone said, how much money can I make off of the excess capacity? And our answer is, as much as you want. Um, really, we're not here to regulate your relationships beyond our own, the prime and first net. So uh, we really uh, want to make sure that you understand the mechanism of the CLA and what that means for you and uh, ultimately what it means for the public-private partnership. So I've talked a little bit about requirements today. I think you're going to hear it a couple times. Um, you could play requirements bingo with me. I'm, I'm telling you, there really isn't other. <laughs> you have 508 pages in front of you, and there are no hidden requirements. It's not like we're uh, trying to pull one over on you guys. It's, it's very simple. We have 16 objectives. And in those objectives, we ask for a lot of things for public safety that we think are important. And far be it from us to hem you into a position where you can't be creative and innovative in how you respond to that. And I mean that. I mean that so much it's in Section M. You'll be evaluated on eva in your ability to be creative and innovative. And answering a 1,000 to 10,000 requirement RFP, it doesn't require you to be that creative. 16 objectives that build the fifth nationwide network, that's going to require some creativity and innovation. And we expect that to show up in your proposals. It's that simple. We talk about this a lot, um, and I don't think we can talk about it enough. It still stays with us. I think for the better part of a year and a half, we've you know, stared down the barrel of your typical government capture managers. And I'll tell you, if you're in charge of this uh, proposal team coming forward, and if you're looking at your government capture managers for a requirements-based solution, you're looking at the wrong people. You should be looking at your, your think teams, the people that get together with whiteboards and sticky notes and try and solve big problems every day, because that's what we're looking for. That's how we run FirstNet. I, I'm looking at TJ here because <laughs> we have a lot of sticky notes upstairs, so a lot of whiteboards too, um, by whiteboard stock. Uh, so th this is really important to us, and it's part of our culture. And if you're still not with us on it, uh, I don't know what else to tell you other than it's, you know, this train's moving pretty quickly. Uh, this is, the RFP is where it is right now. And when we finish Q&A in the next week or so, uh, you're going to have the full set of clarifying amendments. We're going to be moving quickly towards capability statements. And then we're off to proposals. So think about those objectives in the performance work statement. You want to bid back to us because that's where it really matters. So timing of payments. We had a couple questions on this just to sort of change tune a little bit. Um, essentially, what we want to clarify here is that the payment back to FirstNet, and Mike's going to get into this a little bit more in, in depth, but the, the, there was some confusion about when those payments would need to happen. It's, it's an annual payment. We were clear on that. But when it's actually triggered is when those state-ran uh, task orders are let. That's when the process starts. You're looking at 25-year IDIQ, right? 
Um, there's going to be a lot of task orders on that IDIQ, and the payment mechanism back to us is, is very important to our sustainability, and it's important that you guys understand exactly what that means in terms of the schedule. So we've laid it out, actually. We clarified in the RFP, we provided a document that shows that table. Um, the timing, again, controls everything here. And when Mike gets up here and talks about what this means for you guys, uh, it's going to be very important that you listen and, and you, you understand what this means with the CLA as well um, and how that works for you and how it's going to work for FirstNet and work for public safety. So I bring that up because it was a very important clarifying amendment last, uh, I think, on Amendment 3 we put it in. And we hope we've, uh, we've clarified all of that for you. So let's talk moving forward. Terry Callahan is going to give you some key dates. Um, she's going to talk about some, uh, some next steps at a high level. Uh, but what you see here is the timeline that we've shown before. We've adjusted it to reflect our amendments that give us extensions. Uh, you know, from left to right, we've obviously said in the RFP that November is the time frame in which we want to make an award. Uh, these things are all subject to change based off the complexity and volume of propos proposals that we receive. Um, we, we said that earlier in the December board meeting that we were going to award by the end of the year. When the RFP came out several weeks later, uh, we clarified that for uh, the November award date. Um, but what you see here is a phased evaluation. Terry's going to get into that as well. Um, and if you didn't pick up on it in Section M, we have a phased evaluation because we want opportunities uh, moving forward to do uh, not just a one-off, right? We want to make sure that the capability statements are assessed, that we have those interactions, that we can build some buffer in for potential technical uh, demonstrations and uh, oral uh, discussions, or oral presentations, and uh, obviously discussions down the line. We just put out a clarifying amendment last night, or a response last night, that uh, you know we will be having discussions. This is within our right. We're, we intend to do this, especially with something this complex. Um, and that's really important for us to make sure that you're all clear on that. Um, it says questions are due on February 12th, but, and, and this is something I also wanted to put out for everybody here to understand. As long as the RFP is open and proposals are being evaluated all the way up to award, you know, it says in the RFP you guys can actually ask questions of FirstNet, clarifying questions of FirstNet all the way up to award. We reserve the right whether to answer them or not, but it's going to help. If you, if you have a question, ask the question. If you feel you want to hedge on your assumptions, fine. But to the part where, you, or to the extent that you want to put us on record to clarify the actual RFP, it's important that you do it. I think you did a really good job meeting our, our goal to have the close off on February 12th. The last questions we got was 12:58, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So I applaud you. Um, but uh, today is about you asking us questions as well. And moving forward, you know, we don't want to go completely dark. If there's something that's preventing you from really understanding something in the RFP. I think Terry would tell you that, that this is, this is the, the avenue by which you should do this. You should send your question in officially as you have in the past. It's in Section L in the RFP. It gives you the instructions on how to do it. Uh, and really, uh, it makes sort of everyone accountable. So this process is important to us. It has been important to us. Um, and it will continue to be so. Again, I've talked about capability statements not being a requirement. However, they are due on March 31st after the extension. We look forward to seeing those. Uh, obviously, the earlier the better. But if you can, if you can use that time, I would. Um, and then we'll work together, uh, the team internally, to figure out when those responses will go out to you guys and when the, uh, the actual meetings will, will take place if you so choose to take them. Um, beyond that, proposals will be due again on May 13th. Yes, that's Friday the 13th. Don't read into it. Um, that just happened. It just happened. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but we have a phase evaluation moving through a ward where we have uh, two th evaluation phases two through four, which Terry will, will go into that in a little more depth. And then finally, our anticipated an award in November. It doesn't mean it couldn't be earlier. It doesn't mean it won't be later. But that's where our schedule has taken us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our CEO, Mike Poth, to talk about the first net value proposition. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Poth, the CEO of FirstNet. Some of you may know in a previous life um, out in Arizona, I was a SWAT officer. And the first thing we do rolling up on a hostile 
hostage situation in a house is we cut the power to make it uncomfortable for the hostage takers so that maybe they'd give up. And it felt very similar to this room with the heat in here, so we do apologize. And we're not trying to uh, sweat you out or uh, you know throw a flashbang at you or anything else. We're, we're trying to cool it down, but probably by the time we're done, it'll finally get to the uh, temperature we need to be at. As James said, I wanted to spend a little time and talk about the public-private partnership. Today, we're about halfway through the RFP process, a couple more months to go. And as we hit the midway point, I'm very pleased, and I really appreciate all of your time and energies and efforts to date on this effort. We know this is a significant undertaking, and it's not taken lightly by any of your organizations. So thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, since someone coming on board as the CEO, I've had three main goals uh, for the organization myself. First is that we build an effective, customer-centric, cost-effective organization so that we are in a position to be a true partner, a partner to industry and a partner to public safety. As an independent authority, we've established some pretty rigorous policies, practices, procedures, and operational uh, paradigms that will guide us through this partnership over the next 25 years. The value props that we provide the, with FirstNet and what the contractor receives still hold true today. Um, and our, our equally during this effort is our continued outreach to public safety. FirstNet wasn't born to just um, push this RFP out award and then we go on to something else. So we have set up the structures and we are in place to continue to grow. The second responsibility I have is to maximize and grow shareholder value just like any other business. Who are my shareholders? My shareholders are public safety. So that is the focus and how we accomplish that is just like any other business. I try to keep my costs down and I try to maximize my revenues. And any excess of that is a, a ultimately will come a benefit to the shareholder, just like your shareholders. And the third goal that I've set out is developing a, business, a compelling business model that all of you will find very attractive to where you can be a successful partner with us and be profitable. Because as I've said since I've been in this position, the only way public safety and FirstNet will be successful is if you are. It is not the, by design and the RFP our intent to make this to where it's an untenable situation for your organization because your shareholders are expecting, expecting you to maximize your value um, to FirstNet and to them through their investments that they've made. So it is a unique partnership that uh, has been born. It's being solidified through this RFP and will absolutely be cemented through the award of the contract. Keep going backwards. Many of you have seen this slide before. So this unique opportunity, as we've said, it's a statement of objectives is driving our partnership. Uh, the partner will obtain positive cash flow long before a partner that may, say, participate in a spectrum auction. Uh, we've kind of walked you through this uh, quite a few times. But if you consider the timing, clear spectrum available at contract signing day one for your quickly to monetize and maximize the potential of that spectrum, we think is a very significant value prop. And this doesn't even take into consideration the additional infusion of the $6.5 in cash that is available to help you turn uh, your cash flow positive in a much quicker scenario. This is what's truly setting us apart um, from some of the other opportunities and certainly the, the spectrums that you may currently be uh, examining or participating with either on teams or others. So we feel that this is the, the key, one of the key components for FirstNet and for public safety that we want to re-emphasize so we put this to you. But the most the next important is the business model. And this is where I want to spend most of my time. The business side of the deal and take the, a closer look at the true value of the FirstNet model. First, it begins with the value blocks that we've been having, that we own and can contain by statute. We have 20 megahertz of spectrum, beachfront property, spectrum that doesn't go against FCC caps. We have 6.5 billion in cash 
and we also have the public safety market that is poised, ready to you know, participate in this. So that we feel that those are very significant values that we are bringing to the table as part of this partnership. We certainly understand the partners are also going to have to bring significant um, value to the table for this to be successful, but we think that those uh, um, is pretty a compelling offering. It's, uh, you know, it's important to note that we believe strongly, obviously, that the value of the spectrum that's available that will be in this contract, that 20 megahertz of spectrum, is certainly more valuable than the 6.5 billion in cash that is also part of this deal. Uh, all of you live in this world just as much as we do, and you can start doing some simple math. So if you assume, depending, and there's a lot of variables, obviously, on your, ne your network architecture, your approach, but if you took an assumption, for example, of say 20 to 40 million devices were able to get onto the first net band 14 through your efforts, and you uh, take an, another assumption of uh, average user revenue per month on those devices, 30 to 50 dollars, times 12 months, times 25 years, starts to be a significant uh, uh, amount of revenue. We certainly realize there's a significant amount of cost. You have the uh, your GNA, you have possibly, you know, uh, more loads on uh, sub-tiering with some of your subcontractors, all those factors we're certainly sensitive to. But even with those, we believe that this is a significant value that uh, FirstNet and public safety is bringing to the table on behalf of this partnership. The other thing is that, um, you know, the, the monetization, as James pointed out earlier, is truly in your hands. How much can you do? How quick can you go? Is, is what we're looking and seeking for as we consider our objectives-based approach. You tell us, and we're going to support that the best we can through this partnership. So the limitations of, you know, how quickly can you ramp up, onboard, build out, that's all going to be driven by you and your desires. So from day one to day 9,125 days later, 25 years, you have the ability to monetize that value. And I keep you know, pointed to that because we truly believe that is a significant value that makes perfect business sense for all of you sitting on the other side of the table. As we move to the uh, right of the graphic, I want to kind of draw your attention. In these slides, as James mentioned, and the presentation will be available so you can review in detail much later, is that there are two broad terms that affect the business model. First is meeting public safety's objectives. We've talked about in previous uh, meetings, it's in the RFP, our 16 objectives. And then also meeting the uh, payments to FirstNet. Stronger offers that perform better on meeting our 16 objectives, coverage, capacity, reliability, cyber, for example, are going to fare better. That also includes on the payments. It is our job as a trust for public safety to our shareholders that we maximize their value also. So it is with that that we've constructed and is in the RFP the minimum payment schedule. So, and it is a minimum. It is the floor, not the ceiling. It's the floor, not the ceiling. So let's spend a little time. What is that payment schedule? And what, what is the gist? And how is that going to be operationalized over the life of this contract? You know, I obviously am strongly encouraging offers to maximize the uh, payments to FirstNet as part of that value prop, as part of the evaluation, along with it, you know, maximizing your approach to the 16 objectives. But let's review some of the key points on that minimum. First of all, if you go back to my earlier hypothesis, this, that, that minimum payment or whatever you propose above that minimum payment truly doesn't reflect what we believe is the true value of the spectrum and what um, uh, FirstNet and public safety is bringing to the table. I would expect uh, you all to see that the value in FirstNet have an additional funding to help drive new initiatives, new technologies, new approaches over the next 25 years would be a, a, a value add for you also. As noted in the arrows, and it's driven be, uh, in between the partner and the FirstNet boxes, the costs, our excess revenues above our operating costs will be reinvested back into the network. So the excess revenues above our costs are going to be reinvested back into the, to the network. We are a not-for-profit organization, obviously. Our statutory requirements say that we need to reinvest into the network, 
but it's also our requirements and our moral obligations to do that on behalf of public safety. So our operating costs are going to be fixed and controlled and closely guarded. Our excess revenue above that, we are going to reinvest, reinvest back with our partner. We're going to um, put some of those funds into reserve for a recompete. If you can imagine, we're already thinking about recompete in 25 years. So um, start, you know, building your plans for uh, uh, the recompete in, in year 26. And also the reality is technology, and this technology is evolving so quick, who knows what the public safety technology needs will be in year 10, 20, 25. This gives us flexibility to invest with our partner and into the industry with the technology, with the excess funds that will become available. And I think that's a key component. I want to reemphasize it's not just our operating costs that you are seeing in that table. We've also tiered the uh, minimum payment requirements because we understand your costs, your ramp up are more laden up towards the front end until you start maximizing and optimizing the network. It is going to take you X amount of years. So sensitive and trying to be a true partner in this relationship, we've tiered the minimum payments. But once again, it is a minimum. We say that's the floor. I'm very interested in what the ceiling will be from our offers. This, uh, these reinvestments are going to help public safety's footprint with our partner, you know, expand our rural build-outs, additional technologies, you know, additional RFPs as, as technology and needs of the public safety that we determine through our um, ongoing outreach over the years makes sense for us to invest back into the network, back into this mission for public safety. They're going to be based on the priorities and needs of public safety in support of the national network as approved by our independent board of directors. And that's a key component. The same board of directors that are also going to prove and ensure that our costs are at the true minimums to be, run an effective organization. These funds are not to build a large bureaucratic organization. They're there to benefit for a national build-out that will benefit states, locals, and public safety entities throughout uh, our land. And like I said, we can't predict in the coming years, and, and if you can, you're way ahead of us, what the needs are going to be in year 10, 15, 20. And so with the excess funds that are available, those will be reinvested back into it. We need to have that ability. And as I said, even though it's a statutory requirement that we reinvest, it's something that is uh, very important for public safety. And FirstNet, as the stewards of public safety, take that very serious. And as I close, I want to you know, kind of bring it full circle. So we're, we've spent months, years, four years now, the four-year anniversary of uh, FirstNet. You've spent countless hours and countless dollars working on the deal, the business deal. You're teaming, you're not teaming, you're doing these things and all that kind of stuff. Very, very important, complex discussions, contractual relationships, all these types of things. Critically important to the success of this um, RFP and to the six ultimate success for public safety. But I kind of always want to bring it back full circle for you know, our organization and certainly for you all. This is about public safety. And we want, obviously, public safety industry and first not to be successful, but public safety takes the lead in that because this is for them and to help, you know, save lives, putting, putting technology in public safety's hands that may, might make a difference just day two of this being enabled. So although it gets very easy, you know, even as a first net, even as states, even as industry to kind of get wrapped around the, the art of the deal and what it really means. And this is very complex, serious, deal and we get that and we're not trivializing the you know the complexity of what you're asking your organization and your leadership teams to take on but we always kind of want to bring it back that everything that we do and when I say we I mean first net public safety the state's industry it should be with that lens of what's in the best interest of public safety at first net our first job has been to develop this RFP that will generate competitive bids, and I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to get some great offerings from uh, you all and your organizations in the coming months, so we're really excited, and thank you again for your interest and your efforts to date on this. 
But our second is also to work in partnership for years to come with you and with public safety to really bring this vision to reality for public safety in the years to come. So I want to thank you again very much for your, uh, your time and your efforts. And then I, I will now turn it over to our contracting officer, Terry Callahan, that will uh, uh, give the next portion. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, we have a theme that goes on in our teams. Mike talked about how hot it is in here. The theme is, is that when everyone in the room is hot, I'm usually comfortable because I'm always the one that's freezing. So when they talk about turning on the air conditioning, I'm like, oh, please don't do that. I do want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank you for your continued interest in FirstNet's nationwide public safety broadband network. It is near and dear to my heart as I was a public safety entity. I did volunteer in fire and rescue for 12 years. So I'm very passionate about this project and I'm very thankful that I'm part of the team that's gonna bring this to reality and to success along with you guys. So let's go ahead and move into some of the key topics that I have to cover today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the highlights and the key dates for the solicitation. Section L does state that we're going to do a single award, and we made a determination a long time ago that that was the best interest for the project, the overall project, in order to get us a nationwide solution. We're going to um, move forward getting that done in the time frame that James pointed out and the timeline that he had there. Again, sometimes dates do slip, sometimes we can accelerate, but we're going to try and stick to that timeline as best as we can. We have up here that we had a key date, a key milestone vendor clarifications, January 13th of this year through February 12th. That was just for the RFP. As James talked about earlier, and as Mike has too, there's been a lot of feedback that we've been able to gain. We've done significant RFIs. We still do outreach and consultation, and we will continue to do that to ensure that we have the players and the stakeholders and the people that are involved to make sure that this is successful. We issued several special notices to get feedback from industry and the stakeholders. And we've held industry days similar to what we're doing today. We did receive 402 questions. To date, through Amendment 4, we have issued 334. We have 68 left to go. We're going to work around the clock as hard as we can to get these out as fast as we can to you. That way it'll give you good information to put into your capability statements and to help you start formulating your proposals. The ones that we've put out so far to date, there are a lot of clarifications, as James and the rest of the team have alluded to in this meeting today, that we have not changed our strategy. There are not significant changes for Section L or Section M. A lot of them were clear, clarifying statements or clearing up pieces of our solicitation that you provided feedback to, as well as the stakeholders did, to make the capability statements and proposals better solutions. We can continue to take questions, as James had said. The solicitation actually states that we reserve the right to answer it. We'll take a look at any questions that come in, and if it's something that we feel that it's very important that we answer, we will answer it. We will get it out as soon as possible, and it will be posted to the Federal Business Opportunity site, as everything has been so far. I want to clear up a couple things about the teaming and partnering list that we've been putting together. I've been getting some questions asking how people can get on the FirstNet approved list. It's not a FirstNet approved list. It is a list that we have been working on to pull together as a tool for you to help you come together as a team to help formulate a nationwide solution. We do not endorse any of the capabilities and the companies that are out there, and you do not have to be on this list in order to participate in this acquisition. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. We get into capability statements. Capability statements, I want to make sure that you know that they are not required. They are strongly encouraged. We will not be making any of that information public. The United States Code prohibits us from releasing any source selection sensitive information, and the stuff that you provide us is classified as such. So we will not be sharing any of the information with regards to anything that we receive from you except for the Q&As. And some of the ones you'll see, maybe we sanitized it because some companies actually put their names in the question. We sanitized it so we would not release that for information either. We want you to make sure that you think about the capability statements. 
It's a great opportunity for you to come in and provide us with information to demonstrate the key topics and the key areas that are in the objectives that we have. Public safety user adoption, that is very critical for a successful nationwide solution. The coverage and capacity nationwide, we've answered several questions on that. That's also very key. It's a very key topic. Gives you an opportunity in your capability statements to look at that information. The rural partnerships, that's been another key area that we've looked at and we had Q&As on that too. We've also looking at the ability to monetize the network capacity as Mike had talked about, that's critical in the financial sustainability that FirstNet must achieve. We want to make sure that we tell you, we don't want to see your marketing materials in the capability statements. That won't do industry or FirstNet any good. We know what the market is out there. We've done a lot of outreach. We've done a lot of consultation. It's your opportunity to demonstrate to us, the government, and to FirstNet, that you have the capabilities within this area. It also gives an opportunity for us to give feedback to you with regard to the information you come in in your capability statements with those key topics. We want to make sure that we help you give the feedback to help you come up with a strong nationwide solution that is going to be meeting the needs of the public safety community. So think about that as you're drafting your capability statements. We don't need the marketing materials. We need you and the teaming partners that you have pulled together to demonstrate up front you can meet a nationwide solution. Give an opportunity for us to meet with you and provide feedback to help you with those stronger solutions that you can bring to the table. We're going to provide that feedback as soon as we can. We will conclude evaluating all capability statements before we send out any of the notification with the feedback that we're going to provide you. We're going to get it done as quickly as we can so that it will be a benefit to you as well as to the program in formulating your final proposals or your proposals that come in the door in phase two. Proposals are due on May 13th. I think it's two o'clock. We have some going to my facility as well as Boulder because we have teams in various locations. We require three proposals, three volumes, and the volumes are the business management volume, the technical, and the pricing. We have expertise in all of these areas to assist me with the evaluation to make sure that we evaluate the best overall value. We are going to be looking at them to make sure that you have provided the three volumes and the documentation that is to be required in those volumes so that we can conduct a meaningful evaluation based on the solution that you're bringing to date. James talked a little bit about the potential of holding discussions and negotiations. Everybody says we will have it. The government reserves the right. So if you look at the FAR clauses, and I can even tell you that one, and the team laughs at me too because I can rattle those off. It's 52215-1. Reserves the right to have them or not have them. And we would have them if I feel that it's meaningful and that it will help you if I need to def identify any deficiencies, significant weaknesses, any adverse past performance information, and to help you ensure that you're bringing the best solutions forward in your proposals. We'll make those determinations as we go along throughout the process. So don't forget these key dates. The ones that are coming up, the teaming partner list, we'll, we're going to shut that down May 17th. We'll publish the last one probably on the 18th, so everyone has an opportunity to get on it if they want to. March 31st, we encourage you to submit the capability statements. It's a great opportunity for you, and it's a great opportunity for us to ensure that the proposals that come in as a result are very strong, sound nationwide solutions to meet public safety needs. And then the proposal date, of course, May 13th. Please don't miss it, because if you're late, you're late. Let's go into a little bit about Section M. We're doing this in the multi-phase approach that we talk about. The first phase is capability statement submission. We put the key topics in Section L that you need to cover in there, and I went over those. We also addressed in Section M the criteria that we're going to be utilizing to evaluate those capabilities. We're going to give you the feedback to let you know whether we feel you're a viable competitor we're going to let you know where the strengths and the weaknesses are and potentially give you an opportunity to come and meet with the FirstNet team and myself one last time, potentially one last time, before we get to the proposals. 
I really, really encourage you to take a look at that. And again, please, not marketing. We need to know that you can do this and meet the capabilities of the topics we have. Then we get into phase two. Phase two is when you submit those three volumes in the proposals. We put out a lot of clarification questions, excluding some of the content from the page limitation. Make sure you go take a look at section L where we've clarified that. Look at the Q&A so that you're sure what goes into the page limitation and what doesn't. We will start with a conformance check. It will be myself and a couple other members of the team. We'll say, did each of them submit three volumes? And in those volumes, do they have the documentation in there that we asked for? If you don't submit the documentation, it doesn't give us an opportunity to conduct a meaningful evaluation of your proposed solution, which would be a shame. Then we're going to get into phase three. We have two items in there for phase three for the pass fail. The minimum payment thresholds, which we have identified in section B. So make sure you take a look at that. And the information that's in section L that will help us make the determination that you can meet those minimums as you say you can. And then the rural partners and the subcontractors. That's a key component as well. We had several clarification questions on that, and I believe the team came together and have submitted a response that will really make sure you understand where we're coming from and looking for for that pass fail. Once we get through that phase, we will move into the detailed evaluations. We have a team of experts that are going to come together as well as myself. We are going to read all of the information that you provide us in your, solicit in your proposal. So again, make sure that you address the items, that you address the information that we've looked for in section L to help us clearly understand your solution so that we can do an analysis and make sure that we pick the best value solution, taking into consideration all of our objectives that we have in the value proposition that we've identified in section L and section M so that we can choose the best, they like to call it a partner, I like to call it a contractor. So we make sure that we have the best team, government and industry, to support our stakeholders and support public safety mission and needs. I had just some little closing remarks. For those that have been here before, I don't have the big disclaimer, but I do have a little disclaimer. And this disclaimer lets you know that anything here is not binding. My solicitation document is what's binding. My laws and regulations that I follow, and the team will tell you that I follow them very rigorously. I want to make sure that I'm compliant and that we're fair to everyone. So I do follow the laws and regulations. I try to find the flexibility when I can to make sure that the project, as well as my stakeholders and industry, we can get the best solution that's out there. But the solicitation and any subsequent amendments are what govern this acquisition and the process. In the solicitation as well, in Section L, I make sure that I tell you not to engage in conversation with any of the team members or any of the government personnel, the board members, that work on this project. It could give an appearance of a conflict even if it was innocent, and I would hate to have to have a conversation with any of you that says I have to remove you from further consideration because of something that gave an appearance of a conflict. I'm very strict when it comes to that. There's nothing I want to do to jeopardize my, jeopardize my customer or my project as we're going through the acquisition process. And I'm here to make sure that we have an unbiased and fair evaluation of all the solutions that come in. We are going to make the slides available today. They will be up on the FirstNet website, so you'll be able to get that information from there. Any other information, any instructions, criteria, objectives, it's all contained within the solicitation and or subsequent amendments that we have issued to date. Keep an eye on FBO for things that come out. We do anticipate the rest of the questions coming out very shortly and any amendment changes that will happen. You can set up an FBO that it will automatically notify you if I issue an amendment to the solicitation. So I recommend that you do that. We're going to go ahead and take questions now. The way we're going to take questions today is we're going to take them in the room here. I do ask that you walk up to the mic so that the people that are on the webcast can hear you. And the other way that we're going to take questions is via the chat on the webcast. We are not going to take them via the operator on the phone today. So it's just questions in the room and on the webcast via the chat. I want to reiterate that we reserve the right to answer them today or not answer them today. We will do our best with them. 
we will be posting any of the questions today as an amendment to the solicitation like we have been since we've got the questions when the solicitation was issued in January. Again, I want to thank you for your participation and your continued interest. And please, please think about the CAPE statements and all the information you've gotten today, as well as formulating your proposals, because they're coming right down the pike. Thank you. not been able to find a format for capability station. Is it pretty free form? Yes, it is. Okay, thanks. And if you look at the last amendment, amendment number four, we clarified that question. Do we have any on the chat? Okay, in the room? Hello. Uh, specific to Section J-17, the site summary, uh, given the national span of, of some folks' networks, this could constitute millions of data points included into that section. And looking at it all encompassing, you, it, you get an entire view of a, a carrier's network. So from an operator's perspective, this is very highly uh, sensitive, proprietary, secure information. Um, and if, clearly for FirstNet building a secure network, you wouldn't want that, that information out in the public sphere. So uh, we're asking, would you consider reviewing that information in a clean room to make sure that it continues to be secure in a sensitive manner. Yes, we will. We will take a look at that. We are very strong on protecting proprietary and classified data. So the team, we will take a look at that and we will consider that and to ensure that we protect everybody's proprietary data. Thank you very much. Do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, if we do follow up on that, that's going to come out in a clarification or some sort of written response from us to make sure that we're on the record with that. Very good. All right, thank you. Nothing on the chat in the room. Can you come up to the mic, please? Hi, so I have more of a general question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the opt-in, opt-out process for the states, but if you move that up a level to the federal level, will this be a mandatory contract for federal agencies to join first the first net network? I'm going to turn to Jason in a second, but I'll say that uh, first off, um, if you're a federal agency, there's no opt-in, opt-out mechanism or provision in the act. And, and second, uh, we have a pretty strong federal consultation and outreach effort underway to sort of work with the CIOs, CPOs, other customers around the federal government to, who would likely want to be a part of this, this service. So I wouldn't use the word mandatory, but we've been pretty uh, outgoing with our federal partners to make sure they're aware we're coming. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have a uh, full-time staff that's dedicated to reaching out to federal agencies and consulting with them as well. Um, I think we are seeing strong interest uh, in this network and what it can do for federal pub public safety uh, uh, responders throughout the country. Um, certainly, uh, it's not mandatory from the opt-in, opt-out uh, decision piece. And also, just like it is for public safety in the field, folks have the ability to, to sign up based upon the, the great service that comes forward uh, in the future. So um, with that, I'm good. Nothing to add. I think that Good. covers it, unless, unless you need clarification. Yeah. Nothing on the chat? Anything else in the room? Hi. Um, my name is Carrie Johnson from SDN Communications, and we're a uh, rural provider um, based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. We operate a fiber network um, in eight states in the upper Midwest. And beyond the uh, getting yourself on the teaming list, are there any other recommendations that you would have for um, rural providers that are interested in playing a role in the successful deployment of FirstNet? So I'll, I'll start. I'd say absolutely start with the teaming list. Um, and then within your own community of practitioners reaching out and doing your own networking to the extent that you can, it's really important to get that out there. To, for our part, We've been very vocal for the better part of two years about how important this is to us, and we've sort of pushed the rest of industry in that direction to sort of um, not necessarily play matchmaker, but to put them in the right direction of who to talk to. Um, and actually, our last industry day, we had uh, about an hour at the end where we tried to get 
those folks, uh, rural or otherwise, up together to have a networking moment, if you will, uh, to sort of exchange information. We've got 640 people or organizations on that teaming list. Um, and if you aren't, aren't already there, this is a really good point. You'll, you'll want to go out there first uh, and be as social about that as possible. Make sure folks know that you're there. Uh, it's very important to us that you maximize that as a tool. Can I ask one more follow-up? I know there's sure. been a bit more clarification on um, the capability statement, but for offerers, um, how are they expected to uh, outline the kind of the meaningful partnerships that they either have in place or that are planned. If you take a look at the instructions in Section L, it does, does give you some guidance and information with regard to how we're looking or the information that we want you to provide from that perspective. So any information that you already have regarding any teaming that you bring to the table, my suggestion is that you identify it in your capability statements. That helps support your capability for a nationwide solution. I mean, I'll add to it as well. I, I understand the conundrum uh, quite clearly. We've been really trying to be very direct to offerers to make sure that they're out teaming with the right partners, bringing them to the table. Um, and we're expecting to see that in proposals and that they're, they're meeting our rural build-out milestones and how are they meeting that. And we have some speci specific parts of the objectives in there to be evaluated. Um, you'll even see in some of the slides we had today, we talked about you know rural as one of those key components we're going to be looking at first. It's very, very important, and we've heard this across the country as we've gone to consultation, uh, that for rural public safety providers, they really want to see uh, their rural coverage needs met. And, and I strongly encourage you know, both uh, people who are proposing as a prime offer on this and for all of the, the, the telecoms, rural telecoms and others, and, and key infrastructure providers to get together and put together the best possible solution that they can. There also is a template in one of the attachments that helps you provide that information. So take a look at that. And we just posted an updated teaming list today on FBO, so take a look at that as well. Nothing on web? Any other questions in the room? Hi there. Chris Sedell with Vertical Bridge. Um, do you get a sense that industry has um, gotten the message that providing great insight into what deployment is going to look like, that that's got to shine through in the proposals? Or does that seem like something that will come downstream? That's a, you know, a series of task orders later. So it seems to me that the deployment piece is, uh, maybe because there's so much to do, it's kind of getting pushed downstream. Just interested in your insights on that. So a couple things on deployment and timing. Um, I'll answer it from the, the standpoint that you have an IOC, FOC in front of you in the RFP, for instance, right? Um, and what we've done is provided a baseline or a set of objectives in that IOC, FOC that we expect proposals to come back and answer pretty directly. And it doesn't have to be the timelines that we've established within the IOC, FOC, but there are considerations, obviously, with some of the more unique elements of the Act, right, that we have to sort of embrace and move forward with. Um, Sooner the better, right? Uh, speed of deployment is really one of our objectives. It's important that we get to market as quickly as possible. We expect during the proposal process to get a better picture of how industry feels about deployment um, and what tools they're going to bring to the table to get us that speed to market and get us the network that, that public safety needs. And again, it's all around those objectives uh, standpoints. I, I didn't want to and I don't think we wanted to release a series of requirements around a timeline that would really hem you into that specific kind of deployment. Um, that's really up to the offer to bring to the table. Now, on Q&A, we've gotten questions on this, and some really good questions, and we've tried to, our, to our best ability, clarify our positioning around a deployment schedule uh, post-award. Um, but really, it's, it's that proposal process that's gonna help us understand what, you know, in addition to our objectives, what the offer's objectives are gonna be with regard to that. And Thank I know you. that Amendment 3 and Amendment 4 put out some revisions clarifying some of the task orders and the deployment and the timelines with regard to IOC, FOC as well. And I think just at a really high level, it's important to Chris' question that you know, we're really expecting these proposals to outline the individual proposers' plan and schedule to deploy and that they're going to be competitive in doing that and hopefully wanting to do better than even some of the key suggestions that have been put out there. on webcast, okay? Yeah. Hi, dear. 
I work with a group of rural wireless carriers on uh, attempting to access some of these first net opportunities and create partnerships. And one of the things that I've noticed in my conversations with some of the state SPOCs mm -hmm. is that there has been um, little communication between the small rural wireless carriers and the state SPACs. Uh, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that there's a resource issue here for the small rural carriers in that they don't have people like me who can come and talk to people like you or potential other primes who would be submitting contracts. So first of all, I offer myself up to the room. <laughs> <laughs> I have very many friends in the rural wireless area. Um, but more importantly, um, in my conversations, the SPOCs, some of them have become a little nervous about the lack of, at least in conversations with me, about the lack of um, outreach from the rural wireless industry and their engagement in this process. And so some of the questions that have come about have been about whether the state SPACs in evaluating the winner of this proposal, um, whether or not each state will have their own criteria to grade your final winning bid when they start to consider opting in, opting out. And as a part of that, I know there's this 15% threshold. Um, the SPACs have expressed concern to me that the 15%, as you said, was just a, a base that they would encourage more uh, coverage than what you all are going to be grading them on. But um, how, how does that tie in ultimately to your ability to win over the states with your final proposal? if we've got this kind of disconnect between the rural wireless carriers, communicating with the SPACs, communicating with primes, again, I'm available for conversations, <laughs> and, um, and helping the states to drive that coverage into the rural areas so that there is uh, coverage there. I will leave you to answer. So a couple things. First off, you're doing the right thing by standing up and introducing yourself to all of the, the primes or offers in the room. Uh, highly encourage that. Uh, I think that's important step number one. Um, I know some have already been doing that. Uh, a good example, SDN Communications. I see NTCA in the room. Uh, I know CCA has been doing that with a lot of rural partners. The rural uh, wireless and other associations have been doing a spectacular job of getting out to um, their rural constituents. I've spoken at many of their conferences, um, uh, hopefully almost all of them, and we have teams that have been going out and doing that for this exact reason. So we are with you uh, trying to encourage that to happen. At the same point, with an objective-based, performance-based procurement, we're not being overly prescriptive. So we've done some things like the 15% uh, to really push people in the right direction. But at the same point, we want a cost-effective and sustainable solution. And so we need people to create those teams and those partners that is best for that solution. Um, that's going to be all different sizes of partners and so forth to make that work. Um, we really want you all to offer, as rural participants, up to teams to get the right teams together to make that work, just like you're doing. And I know many others are doing the same thing. We want to encourage prime offerers to embrace that and to meet with you and talk to you and do the best job they can to build a spectacular team. And that's what we're hearing from the states when we go out and talk to them. They want to see great teams that are brought together that know their needs and can meet their needs. And I, I believe that's happening. I, I don't know because we won't know till we get proposals, but I've seen a lot of resonance in the consultation efforts that we've been doing to that, and I know that they've had a lot of uh, players out in the fields that, that have talked to them to try to push that forward. I think it's really important as we kind of work through this that this is an ongoing process. I think there will be teams that will occur now through proposals. I think there'll be more that form even after proposals and after award. I think there will be many times that some of this will happen now, some of this will happen later, but I encourage it to be an ongoing effort and to continue to do it. Um, I think from the state's perspective, you know, they have a, an important decision with the opting out and opting into the, uh, the, the RAN portion of the network, and that takes on that risk and responsibility, and they're taking that very seriously. Um, our consultation teams have been out meeting with over 35 states, again, already this year, through either webinars or discussions on the next round of consultations and kind of key meetings that are occurring. So I think that engagement is happening, um, and I look forward to the ongoing engagement and the discussions like you're having in the room here today, which are really important. Nothing on the webcast? Yeah, I'm Tony Bardo with you. 
issues. And parallel to this effort uh, for a couple of years now and ongoing is in the states and municipalities is the nine, NG911 systems. And they are building both systems and networks uh, around those systems. Is there a point at which FirstNet and these 911 systems either have already decided or will decide to coexist, to coordinate, or even merge? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, first of all, certainly we believe that the close coordination between uh, NextGen 911 and all of our public safety answering points in FirstNet is critical. Um, there are folks even in this room, I see the APCO team here and others that I know are, are working on this very closely, we have a new Project 43 and other key things looking at how broadband's going to interact uh, with PSAPs and 911 going forward. There's some great efforts happening across the country to try to continue to find new ways to fund uh, NextGen 911 and to push that effort further and faster. Um, from our act and from our own desires, we certainly want to see that integration occur when FirstNet is deployed and that, that we have key integration going on at all of our public safety centers throughout the country. Um, so I think we've been in close coordination. I think there's been great communication and coordination going on across the country. And um, it's going to be an ongoing effort. It's not something that happens overnight. But I think that you will see the, the great information that comes into 911 centers going out to public safety in the field across FirstNet and leveraging that network so that that information can be a great two-way um, uh, sharing of information and that critical information can get in the hands of first responders in the field. Mary, there seems to be some trouble with people being able to enter questions via the webcast. Hi, I'm Jesse Ward from NTCA, the Rural Broadband Association. Thanks for the shout out, President Kennedy. Um, <laughs> as you know, we've been doing a lot to kind of coordinate our 900 rural broadband providers, our members. Um, and what we've been hearing from potential primes is that uh, they would like one or at least only a few points of contact rather than working with 900 or more uh, companies. So just a clarification question. Um, from the evaluation perspective, when you're looking at that 15% partnership target, um, would it be satisfactory for a prime to show that they're working with an organization like NTCA as opposed to having those separate contracts directly with the rural providers? And would that be satisfactory for the prime to meet that 15% target. During these type of events, we don't get into making a suggestion or stating whether a solution or an idea is acceptable. You'll see that we did that even with the responses. We kept the response to our criteria as stated in Section M. So any solution or idea that you have to satisfy that piece of the solicitation would be put into your proposal and or your capability statements for evaluation by the team. You're more than welcome to submit the question. Okay, so follow up that would be if we work with the prime, potential prime to work as part of a teaming agreement for a capability solution, would we then be able to have that discussion at that time or have that question answered? Um, I Just would so recommend know. You, you ask okay. it now and submit it, and that is feedback that can be provided during the capabilities phase. Phase, okay. And if we go into negotiations and discussions after receipt of proposals, that is another item that can be discussed within that time frame. Okay, thank you. Sure. I will say, though, even outside of the evaluation question, I want to strongly encourage folks to get together the great work that's been done by associations to try to bring together many different uh, rural infrastructure providers, rural carriers, I think is terrific. So uh, I want to encourage it. And certainly uh, the team will look at the official questions that come in. Uh, we're having a problem with our webcast chat, so we'd like to open up the bridge for questions. Any other questions in the room? <coughs> Matt? Does FirstNet plan on being a private entity or the federal entity? FirstNet is a federal entity. Please, chat's working. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks for I guess that. the chat's working job, now. Okay. <laughs> any more questions, Matt? Uh, no? Operator, any questions from the bridge? One moment, please. I actually had a question come through my email because the chat wasn't working. <laughs> Stuart Kathy, your line's open. Hi, this is Stuart Kathy. I'd like to know if the integrated master schedule is included in the page count. Right. Yeah. So the is the master the question is the master schedule included in the page count, and we can take a look at that. Yeah, I would, I'd have to take a look. Yeah. The we, we've obviously released some clarification around attachments. Um, being not included in some of the page counts for some of the volumes of your proposals. Um, you know, typically, this isn't something that we would do, having developed an IMS myself. Uh, that would kill your page count entirely. So I, 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 I thank you for the question, and we'll, uh, we'll get you an official answer. Thank you. Again, if there's any further questions from the phone line, it is star followed by the one. Do we have someone in the room? Uh, thank you. Uh, Hank Rell from AOC. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, first, in volume one, uh, in the questions as part of amendment one, it was clarified that the WBS and the PWS should be presented in section one of volume one. Uh, the WBS is also referred to in section two. I was just wondering if the WBS should be in both locations. We'll take a look at that and see if we need to clarify which one. Sure. Thank you. And, and one additional question. Sure. Um, for the individual grids identified in J1 for the coverage objectives, uh, Section M states that they'll be evaluated on an individual basis as to whether or not they're acceptable. Uh, if an offer solution, uh, let's say, you know, one square mile outlier in Alaska surrounded by, you know, temporary on-demand coverage, one square mile in the middle of that for persistent, mm -hmm. uh, if an offer solution didn't cover that area, would that be seen as making the whole subfactor unacceptable? I don't think we can comment on that specifically. Yeah, I'd have to take a look at that. We do that as part of the evaluation. Um, so my suggestion is to go look at Section M clearly. You could submit that as a question. That would be something that I think is critical that we could clarify. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Cameron Jenna. I have a two-part question. The first part is related to the capability statement, and the second part is more general in nature. Um, the general question is, we've been following this solicitation with great interest for the last couple of years as it's formed, and we've talked to a number of companies in the large business community. Um, obviously, there's a handful of players that could pull off something as large and complex as this and bring all the appropriate partners together, but we've gotten lackluster interest from the big companies. So as with, relate, with regard to that interest, the, how does the panel, how does FirstNet, uh, ensuring that they've got the big players, the people who build the towers, the, um, not just the carrier's um, participation in this, especially with the federal slant that it has. And the second part is capability statements. Are you interested in seeing capability statements from the small business community? And, and how will they would be evaluated against the big players? So I'll start with the second question first. On capability statements, we're looking for anything that can support our nationwide solution. So to the extent that you can populate a 50-page capability statement or however many pages you want it to be under that 50 in whatever format you want to answer what we're asking for and to point to some sort of nationwide solution, uh, yes, we're, we're, we're very interested in seeing those capability statements. Um, on their first question, on what we uh, think or what we can do with regard to teaming and relationships, right? So I'll just speak, um, uh, frankly, industry liaison, which Mary Campanola runs, for the better part of the last, well, the three or four months leading up to the RFP release, we spent every Friday for about six hours every Friday opening our phone lines and talking to folks and coaching up on this teaming list and this tool that we had, we'd sort of put out there. And that was by design, and it grew fairly quickly. A lot of folks really listened to us. In fact, the majority of the folks we talked to in the industry community didn't even know we had one up on the website. So some basic groundwork hadn't been done, and we, that's the extent that we can help folks sort of get their name out there. Um, as I spoke to, to the rural considerations earlier, we can't be seen as a particular matchmaker or an endorsement of a particular partnership. In fact, I'm not even aware of who actual primes are in this instance, and we've done that by design. We want to keep this an open sort of uh, transparent process on our end, and we're certainly curious and excited to see what kind of proposals we get, but 
in no way will I shape what those proposals or what those teams look like deliberately. I don't think anyone on this panel has an interest in doing that, and we think the best people to do that are, are yourselves, and, and really, we, we just, all we can do is wish folks luck and hope that it, it works out for you. Uh, sorry. So, I too have plenty of business. There you go, <laughs> that's right. Teaming. As far as capability statement submission is concerned, we will accept capability statements from anyone that, that is able to demonstrate, as James said, a nationwide solution. We're not looking for individual capability statements to show what your company, the capabilities that you have, as it might relate to a portion of a nationwide solution. This is for a nationwide solution. So there was a question earlier, should they identify teaming partners? This is an opportunity to do that. Bring to the table the capabilities to support it. Whether you're a small company acting as the prime and you've been able to pull together enough partners or you yourself have the capability to do a nationwide deployment, we will look at the capability statements as well as proposals. We're not saying you can't submit if you're a large or if you're a small. So we encourage everybody that feels they can meet the, require, the objectives as stated in our solicitation in accordance with the criteria that we've established, we encourage all the submissions, the innovative creative solutions that you bring to the table. Terry, the only thing I would add is, um, you know, and we've heard a lot of interest in teaming, and teaming's a two-way street, right? We've heard from, from a lot of um, uh, either rural or small um, vendors who may want a team, and I encourage, and I think everyone here encourages, everyone who's out there who thinks they're a prime and plans to, to respond, um, you know, you may feel you have the teaming partners that you need. Uh, as TJ said, this is going to be a dynamic process, I think, throughout, throughout the uh, life cycle of this uh, proposal, but we strongly encourage, this is a competitive um, process. Um, it's an objectives-based process. You heard earlier about innovation. Um, the, the more robust and creative and broad and diverse your solution, the better a consideration it's going to get, you know, based on the evaluation criteria. So I strongly encourage not just the folks who want to be included in teams, but those who are, who are, who are plan on submitting proposals, um, you know, really think about the, the efforts you're undertaking to, to explore what might be unique and new opportunities for you as well. Anybody else in the room? Oh, we got someone on the chat. Yeah, question from, uh, from the chat. Uh, recognizing, that the, recognizing the fact that board meetings are open public meetings, can the contracting officer provide guidance in regards to participation at ne next week's board meeting so as not to present an appearance of conflict? It's an open meeting, yeah. correct? It's, the board meeting is a public meeting, and we have had all of the ethics and procurement integrity training with everyone that is involved in the first MPSBN acquisition. So the board members know what they can and cannot say. We don't prohibit them from talking with people or any of their colleagues out in industry in the field. They just know what restrictions they have that they can communicate any information with regard to the acquisition. So we don't talk about the acquisition. If there's any questions about it, they would be addressed, the instructions that we have. So, but it is a public board meeting. Yeah, I, I, I'll add, I mean, we, we take this particular point uh, extremely, extremely seriously. Um, we are in the very unique circumstances of, of being a government entity with a board that is made up of both government and private sector individuals. They've gone through and continue to go through extensive training and counseling, and we, this is an issue that we deal with them on a regular basis. Uh, for those who have attended our public board meetings know that we start off every board meeting with a conflicts of interest uh, statement and check. Um, we ask board members to, uh, if, if they do have a perceived conflict, to recuse themselves from any discussions. Um, and they're very well aware of this prior to uh, and during the board meeting. So it, it is something we take very seriously, but it is a public forum and we're going to talk about in that public forum, anything that we can uh, be made public, if it is source selection sensitive or otherwise of a confidential nature, of course, won't be talked about publicly. And for the, again, those who have participated know that we have gone into closed session at times as well to protect the integrity of any, uh, any confidential information. I want to go back to the question earlier about the um, WPS and the PWS being excluded from the page limitation. In Amendment 3, we answered a Q&A that said that it is not. We will go back to the team and take a look at it and make a determination if we should exclude it. So take a look at FBO when the 
questions and amendments come back out, as you'll see, there were a couple that we did did resubmit the response. So if we decide that we want to exclude that from the page limitation, we would reissue this response in a forthcoming amendment. So we'll take a look at that. Thanks, sir. Any other on the webcast? A uh, question from the chat from uh, Jay Bridges from AOC. There are no tabs defined in the J17 workbook for best server and RSRP layer statistics. Does FirstNet want statistics for these layers? And if so, what statistics specifically do they want for these two layers? I would suggest that that one be answered by the team. Yeah, we're going to take that back to our CTO shop and talk to them about that. <laughs> How about that? Or Jason, you can take it. <laughs> you know, I have an answer for right everything. Answer so. that That's later. a good question. We'll go back with that. Thank you. Any others in the room? Okay. On the chat? Operator on the phone? Yes, we do. Our, um, we have a question from Jack Hughes. Your line's open. You may ask your question. Hi, yes. Uh, I just wanted to understand if there is uh, any objection to uh, allowing for uh, temporary licenses uh, up until the deployment date to help facilitate adoption. That uh, seems outside of the scope of the RFP. Um. Yeah, I mean, just uh, briefly, uh, our policy on um, uh, temporary licenses and authorizations uh, has not changed. That will continue throughout the life cycle of the RFP, and of course, they're evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the purpose and the need for the, uh, for the authorization. Uh, so if there is a need, you know, certainly we encourage folks to continue to submit those uh, as they have uh, previously, and they'll be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. We have a Thank question. you. Our next question is from Dan from Sapien. Your line's open. Hi, yes. Does the government have any insight or estimation around when any te uh, technical demos or demonstrations might be required as part of the evaluation uh, process? No, we haven't made the determination on the time within the acquisition phases yet. But as soon as we know, we'll let you know. <laughs> and thank you. We have a question from Donnie Jackson. Your line's open. Yes. Um, a recent response that you all had in the Q&A talked about the future expansion of the system, um, and that one way to do it was through a task order or a uh, separate RFP. And um, I guess I was trying to get some information as to how the task order would be handled. Um, I assume that would be within the same, the, the selected contractor. But if there was a subsequent RFP, um, does that change the relationship um, with the contractor in terms of the spectrum use, or could the contractor end up with, uh, for lack of a better term, a partner that they didn't really choose? We have several task orders that we're looking at right now. We have our three day one task orders that we anticipate. That's the mechanism for state plan delivery, the state plan development and refinement, as well as the MPSBM functions. We also anticipate subsequent task orders that we've talked about before with deploying the RAN, the initial RAN and any delayed RAN. If throughout the acquisition that we have the 25-year ordering period on the IDIQ, if we have additional funding we want to utilize to reinvest, we would issue a task order for that. We could. It would not impact any of the use of the spectrum. The spectrum is for the MPSVN and the RAN task orders. So, for example, if we wanted to enhance an area and we had revenue to do that, we could issue a task order that would cover that. But it doesn't have any impact on any of the other task orders for the RAN the, or the core. Does that answer your question? It was hard to hear you. Oh, uh, no, thank you very much. All right, Matt, in the chat room. Question from the chat. What percentage of the payments to FirstNet are for FirstNet operating costs versus network recapitalization? I would ask you to submit that question in writing and the team will consider it. Any, more than that? any others on the chat? Operator, any more on the phone? 
I'm sure there are questions on the phone lines. Any more in the room? Okay, that concludes our pre-proposal conference. Please think about everything that we've provided you today. Take a look at the solicitation. Keep an eye on FBO. And thanks again for your participation.